Hello, and welcome to Horror Boys 4 in Space. I'm Tanner. And I'm Steven. We watched some great movies this week, didn't we, Steven? <laughs> Did we? Um, yeah, like, it was It was a wide range. Most For me, one was at the top, and the others were at the very, very bottom tier. I don't know how it worked for you. Two were slightly above mid-tier, and then two were the lowest tier they could be, I think. Uh, yeah. We followed Uh, the tradition of fourth sequels, or the fourth movie in a franchise taking place in space, so we watched Critters 4, Leprechaun 4 in space, Hellraiser Bloodlines, and Jason X. But Jason X is the tenth one. Jason didn't go to space quite as early. Right, but if we're going off of the zombie Jason timeline, this is the fourth zombie Jason movie. Oh, I gotcha. I gotcha. I'm still mad they didn't explain how he got out of hell. Well, that wasn't Jason, and Jason goes to hell. What is that? Is that canon? I, I don't know. I haven't seen it. <laughs> okay. I could be totally wrong. Uh, what should we talk about first? Well, my plan is to go in order of the release of the films. Although Critters Four came out first, but Leprechaun Four and Hellraiser Bloodlines both came out in 1996, and I didn't bother to Google which came out first. So we'll just we're, do we'll do bloodlines first so we don't no, do two bad films no, in a row. We're doing Leprechaun 4 in space first cuz that's oh. the way I have planned it and that's going to happen. Okay. All right? Okay, that's fine, Steve. All right. So uh I've written an intro for Critters 4 and I'm going to read thought, it now. It's, it's Wait, I thought we were doing Leprechaun 4 first. No, we do that after Critters 4. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Critters, what do they want? Where are they from? These answers are not provided in Critters 4. Not that anyone cared. The previous movies might have done that anyway. I didn't bother to watch them in preparation for this. I thought it would be pretty isolated since it took place in space. And you know what? For the most part, it was. Some bounty hunter named Charlie ends up frozen in a spaceship with the last two critters and gets picked up by a salvage ship. It's kind of like Firefly, except the captain is rapey. Eventually, the Critters' eggs hatch, and Brad Dorif, Angela Bassett, and a lame kid team up with Charlie to kill the Critters. There are only two Critters in Critters 4. Is this intro too long? I'm sure someone will complain if it is. Could it be Tanner? I guess we'll find out right now. No, I don't think that was too bad. No, oh, well. That had me interested. I've only seen the first Critters. Is that the, is that the case with you, too? I don't think I've ever seen the first. I've seen three as a kid on VHS at my friend Dallas's uh-huh. house. And that's it. Oh. Well, the first one's pretty good. Um, It gets a lot of flack for being a Gremlins replica, but supposedly it was written before Gremlins. It just didn't get into production first. I don't know if I believe that, but I want to believe. (laughs) Yeah, Critters 4 was not the original Critters by any means, mostly because it was boring as hell yeah i mean it's really not all that bad it's just so yeah dull. It, it, it has a good cast which kind of makes you want to watch it's not like anything that exciting even happens in the film angela bassett gets a cool moment where a guy's creeping up on her in the shower she pulls him in and you think it's, it's gonna be like oh she has to kiss him now and then she punches him in the face and that was nice yeah, classic Angela Bassett, too. Yeah. She was good in this, and Brad Dorif is good in this, as he is in everything. Has Brad Dorif ever given a bad performance? I, I want to say he probably has, but I don't have concrete proof of that. Just because I feel like he could do one of his character acting moments in like a role that wasn't appropriate, and it came off really bad. But I don't have that movie under my helm. I feel like someone is probably thinking he's bad in Dune, but I disagree. Oh, he's great in oh, Dune. Oh, yeah. His eyebrows in that. Highlight of Dune. <laughs> Dune's good. I don't care what anyone says. There are a few good moments. It's mostly just totally confusing. I've always been able to follow it. I saw it when I was a kid at Best Buy, and I was like, this makes perfect sense. <laughs> You're a weird kid, dude. <laughs> Yeah, like, the only two characters from the original Critters and Critters 4 are Charlie, who was, like, a weird conspiracy theory guy in the first one, and the bounty hunter, who turns into a bad guy in this this one. Spoilers. Oh, my bad. <laughs> Please don't go watch Critters 4. Charlie wasn't even that good in the first one, so I don't know why he was one of the characters that lasted all the way through the series. I think he was in each film, but I could be mistaken. Well, 3 and 4 were shot at the same time. Yeah. So I don't know. 
I can't remember if he was in three. Yeah. Probably. Why not? Let's say he was. Well, he doesn't have much of a career. <laughs> he reminded me of a guy in Tremors, but bad. Yeah, he just, like, that character just wasn't great. It could have been done well, but it just wasn't. It was just kind of lame. I don't know. There's, I don't have many highlights involving Critters. I must say. Honestly, this movie's kind of left my mind already. He is in the third one, I just found Okay, all right. Well, that was really compelling drama for those listening right now. It's fun when the critters are on the screen most of the time, but they don't show up until probably halfway through the movie. Yeah, most of this movie is a kid wanting to go to Earth and then, like, drama involving that and southern twinge guitars playing, which gives off a couple small firefly vibes, but that's not enough to keep me interested yeah it's it's really not that interesting there's just not much to say about it i'm feeling stuck like we were (laughs) last week on um the ambulance the ambulance like it was like fine going through it but i don't have like any strong opinions other than i was like kind of (laughs) bored okay you know what i agree i gave it uh two stars two yeah I gave it one and a half. It wasn't so. bad enough to be a one and a half from me, and Brad mm-hmm. Dorf was in it, but it was very boring, and I'll give it that. Yeah. So, you know what? On the topic of Larry Cohen, mm-hmm. I watched Maniac Cop last night. Yeah. Oh, you did? Did you like it? I thought it was pretty fun. I'm glad. I thought you were going to like give me a hot take <laughs> that was like, it sucked. No. Um, Let's talk no. about Maniac Cop instead of Critters 4. <laughs> Yeah, let's talk about Maniac Cop. I haven't seen it since Christmas break, but let's go for it. Okay, so you got Tom, you got Tom Atkins, and what, Golden. What, when did that come out? Eighty six, something like that. Yeah, something like that. So he's barely older than he is in the Carpenter movies he's in, but he looks like twenty years older because they give him gray hair. Yeah, he looks like Lethal Weapon, <laughs> Tom Atkins. <laughs> yeah, so he's in it, and he plays a detective who uh, believes in what everyone else seems to think is the impossible, which is that a cop is going around killing people, which uh, Mm -hmm. nowadays isn't that shocking of a concept. Yeah, I feel like Maniac Cop definitely, like, I see why they're doing that remake, because I feel like that is, like, honestly a terrifying thing today. (laughs) And I imagine when that movie came out, it was probably a pretty novel idea to do, you know, just this, who can you trust in that scenario, you know? Yeah, like, that stuff was going on, but it was for, like, uh, Rodney King. So, like, I don't know if it was in the popular vernacular yet. Well, Rodney King wasn't until a couple years later. It was, like, 88, right? 89? Yeah, I figure that's the moment where you start having, like, Well, I mean, people who weren't white knew. (laughs) Yeah. Well, yeah, like I said, it's always been a thing, but, like, I don't think it was, like public knowledge or like a lot of people thought that um so it is definitely a novel idea and i i think robert sadar just looks great in it yeah um, yeah he's personally. creepy as hell yeah. is he in the sequels he is yeah okay that's enough for me and, to keep watching and they they show a um replay of that shower stabbing scene in that every scene is sequel. so great you know, Every sequel, they use it. <laughs> while watching that scene, I thought to myself, is this the first instance of prison rape in cinema? Uh, maybe. I don't know. It was a good scene. Yeah, like, no, I'm surprised at well how done. well done it is. Um, that's what that's what my feeling through most of Maniac Cop. It like seems like an exploitation film, and it definitely is. But there's just moments that are like genuinely creepy. And genuinely, like, kind of good cinema. Yeah, the scene where uh, the maniac cop is kind of being resurrected is very weirdly done. I was really into yeah. that. Anytime there's slow motion in that movie, it's excellent. Yeah, you should definitely give the sequels a try. I think I really liked two, and three was still pretty good. It's, like I said, three's probably my favorite. Alan uh, Smithy film. Alan Smithy <laughs> film, yeah. Which we watched one of this week. Which one was that? Hellraiser Bloodlines. Oh, yeah. That was my least favorite Alan Smithy movie. <laughs> um, but, yeah, uh, I'd, give the, I'd give the rest of the series a try. I definitely Plus, will. But not I having mean, Tom Atkins or Bruce Campbell is a little bit of a drag. You get Bruce Campbell for some of two. Okay. That's cool with me. 
Yeah. I will say I wish the movie had dragged out is Bruce Campbell or is Bruce Campbell not the maniac cop a little bit longer because that was kind of the most compelling narrative thread for me outside of Tom Atkins chasing down the maniac cop, you know? Yeah, I feel that. I mean, that cast is just kind of pure 80s schlock and i love it oh yeah i don't know it just has so much going for it great score and think, yeah and i think cohen can write a really tight script mm-hmm. when he wants yeah to. no that movie's perfectly paced so yeah don't watch critters 4 but maniac cop gets our highest recommendation yeah and the next two are done with the same writer director duo oh i didn't know that so director did all three that's cool yeah he it's did not a bad idea he kind of he quit halfway through three that's but... a shame it still kind of feels like his film. Cool. All right. Yeah. So now Good we're stuff. now we're moving on to another movie we hate, <laughs> Leprechaun Four in Space. This one I hated even more, but I feel like I have more to talk about with it. I do too. Maybe that's just because we watched it more recently. <laughs> I get, no, I think Critters Two just didn't have much happen in it, or Critters Four. I'm sorry. Yeah, you should uh, be. So I, I have an intro for Leprechaun Four. All right. <clears throat> Leprechaun 4 was conceived as a parody of Apollo 13. Some hack producers saw that poster and had one made where Leprechaun was there instead of Tom Hanks. I'd rather be stranded in space than watch this piece of shit again. You know that scene in Apollo 13 where they say, we need you to make this fit into this using all of this? This movie is basically what a movie would look like if you showed a children classic science fiction films and then asked them to rework their favorite scenes into the newest installments of the Leprechaun franchise. Audio cues from 2001, a lightsaber, concert references to Alien. There's nothing interesting going on here. I won't even begin to explain the plot to this because I can't. The only thing this movie delivers on is having a leprechaun in space. Tanner, what did you love about this flick? What did I love about it? Well, I don't. I felt like I could follow the plot pretty well. Leprechaun finds an alien princess, wants her gold, bribes her with his own gold, tries to overthrow her father, but then space marines find him, steal his gold. He wants it back. The alien princess gets like quote unquote rescued by the alien marines, space marines, uh, and then the leprechaun wreaks havoc because he. Uh, one of the marines pees on him and then he shoots out of his pee hole. You don't get like a great scene of Warwick Davis like graphically crawling through a urethra though. That would have made the movie for me. There's not even any blood. In this entire movie, there's a little bit of green blood. Well, there's red blood, but it comes from like nowhere. Oh, it just falls on him. Yeah. Yeah, you remember that? Yep. He turns a German robot cyborg guy into a spider scorpion monster. What'd you think of that, Steven? I thought the effect for the spider scorpion monster was pretty good. But the guy kept his ridiculous, like, dumb accent. And he didn't get to kill anyone as the spider monster. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I mean, he was way scarier than the leprechaun ever was. That's true. Um, And even then, he wasn't at all. Yeah, he still looked pretty cartoonish. I think it's just his face. All right, so the leprechaun, this lady and a guy go to to shag up, and the leprechaun... uh, uh, does it's the chest burster scene except it's with a boner basically but he just pops out of this guy's pants it's not a fun kill or anything then he goes around and he rescues he goes back to the princess and then all of a sudden she's a fan of the leprechaun why she was already a fan of the leprechaun because he promised her his gold and to overthrow the king of her planet or whatever and then they could be rich together Okay, sure. That's enough for me. There's a scene where that princess shows her breasts, and then everyone's like, whoa! <laughs> and then they they reveal that she did that because that's a death sentence in, in, her, in her kingdom. That was the lamest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, no, it was bad. Yeah, it was just all lame. It was lame. Like, I can only imagine the 90s teens who watch this who thought it was like so funny but like even in a bad movie sense it's not that funny it's just kind of childish childish boring but not as boring as critters for at least stuff is happening in this it it does a parody angle to it to an extent but not in any Mm -hmm. interesting ways it just will it's like family guy where it'll just take a familiar scene and then redo it in childish Mm -hmm. humor if it had been like a full-fledged parody of alien i might have enjoyed it more yeah well that's another thing we ought to mention is that 
pretty much every film we watched eventually resembles Alien. Because <laughs> it's all, like, space marines or something of the like getting slowly chopped down by whatever horror monster is haunting them. Like, every single one we watched. Yeah, genuinely. Well, I think the one that most resembles Alien was probably my favorite, but <laughs> we'll get to that later. Anytime there's effects done in post in Leprechaun 4 in space, they're shot on tape, and maybe watching it on a CRT TV on tape back in the day you wouldn't have noticed, but nowadays it is right in your face. It's like, okay, Warwick Davis is growing now, but it, this is shot on tape over 35 millimeter film, and it looks really, really bad. He was so fuzzy. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, I don't complain when that happens in Layer of the White Worm, but that's done with a little bit of substance, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, in Layer of the White Worm, they kind of, like, try to conceal it a little bit. Well, and they in only this, do it it's... in specific sequences where everything is shot on tape, so it works. Yeah. In this, it's just, like, <laughs> there's no concealing the, like, <laughs> the, like patchwork behind it. Which is a shame, because the compositing they're doing it for really doesn't look terrible. Outside of when Warwick Davis is getting pulled out of the airlock, his hands are just very obviously floating in front of the, the doors. Yeah, it's kind of a lame ending, too, but I don't want to... No, we'll spoil it. We spoil every single movie we discuss on this podcast. Well, we don't have to spoil everyone. It's mostly just the ones we never want people to watch. <laughs> we kind of spoiled A Quiet Place last episode. You did that. I haven't even seen it. You goaded me into it. I guess that's true. So yeah, Warwick Davis gets pulled into space, he explodes, and then it does the 2001 music cue again, like it's been doing the whole movie, except this time it's actually like the booming drums and the da na na But then it's just a disembodied leprechaun hand giving the middle finger. <laughs> Which was, like, I laugh now, but at the time it was just like, uh... You know, yeah. like, God, what fourth grader made this movie? I was kind of excited for this one. I don't know why. Well, it seems like there's kind of a cult following behind it in terms of, like, bad movie fandom. Mm -hmm. But I don't get it. Like, there's so many other bad movies that are more enjoyable to sit through. And the production values were high enough in it that it didn't have an excuse for just how lazy and predictable the script was. Yeah, surprisingly pretty high production values for the fourth Leprechaun film, I must say. Well, Leprechaun 3 was the most successful movie on VHS of the year it was released. I guess, but that doesn't really mean we should give the fourth one money. <laughs> It's a good point. Warwick Davis also just kind of annoyed me in this one. Yeah, I feel like he chews the scenery more in the other ones. Like, he's actually having fun in the role. Yeah. The, in this one, he's just very obnoxious. Well, I remember parts of the first one that it was he was actually, like, pretty good. Well, he was trying to be scary in that one, and it almost yeah. works, you know? Like, his, his performance in that is kind of reminiscent of Tim Curry in It. Yeah, yeah, I feel where that. It's a bad movie, but there's something there. Yeah. And that's gone in Leprechaun 4 in space. He sort of gets back to chewing the scenery in Leprechaun in the Hood. I don't know why that is. Like, that's the highest rated Leprechaun sequel, I believe. I think people probably just give that one a pass because of uh, diversity. I mean, it's a black exploitation movie. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> Technically. Uh, I was okay. just, uh... Cut that. I was, well, I was making fun of people who were like, oh, I'm not gonna go see Black Panther because, uh, people only like it because, uh, because it's got an ethnically different cast, stuff like that. I gave this movie one star. I also gave it one star. We are in accordance. So to quote, uh, to quote the classic original Leprechaun, starring pre-nose job Jennifer Aniston, fuck you, Lucky Charms. <laughs> She was pretty cute in that first Leprechaun movie. For sure. Should we move on? We'll move on to the next. All right. Hellraiser Bloodlines. It's Hellraiser, but instead of some boring, super serious slog, we get three embarrassing and laughably bad 30-minute stories, one of which takes place in space. It opens with an ugly bald man in space using some incredibly dated CG robot hands to open the puzzle box. The robot blows up and Pinhead appears, and the bald guy, played by Bruce Ramsey, gets interrogated by the space police who conveniently raid a space station at that exact moment. Bald Man tells the stories of two previous members of his bloodline, one in 1796 and the next in 1996. His great-great-great-great-great-grandpa created the puzzle box for Adam Scott, and it's haunted his family ever since. 
How does this fit into the first two films? I have no idea. Remember when that old dude says the box was always his? That was cool. Anyway, I really enjoyed this movie, but now Tanner's going to complain about it. It's just so boring, Stephen. <laughs> I don't know. You said you even liked uh, Pinhead in this, and like, I feel like he has good lines, but he's not like in it enough. Like, I don't think I enjoyed this movie until we get to the scene with the security guards walking into the gateway. That is a great scene. Yeah, but that's the first scene I enjoyed, and that's like 50 minutes into the movie. (laughs) I don't really like any of this stuff in the past. I felt like it was kind of corny, but unintentionally corny and sort of ham-fisted. Oh, that that's never happened in the Hellraiser series. Well, I, I don't know. I just couldn't take Adam Scott seriously, mostly, (laughs) even though he was, like, supposed to be dark and brooding. Oh, you mean, like, the creepy, rapey guy in the first movie? No, I'm talking about Adam Scott in this movie. Yeah, I'm I'm comparing their performances, because they're equally bad and off-key. Oh, I like the creepy, rapey guy in the first movie. I don't, and I really hate the the ugly lady he's sleeping with. I I like the first Hellraiser. It's... Maybe that's why you like this one. Yeah, I've just... it's actually bad. <laughs> I like the gore in these movies and some of the ideas and some of the effects, but they're just... The first two are so serious and dumb. <laughs> and yeah. I don't... Like, I hate everyone in the movies. Like, I don't find any of the characters compelling. The The main girl's all right, but she's not, like, interesting. Yeah, I... she doesn't get that much screen time. No, and... Like, Pinhead betraying her at the end is just boring to me. It's, in this one, you get... Oh, wait, 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 wait. You're talking about Christy. I thought you were talking about Bloodline right now. No, no, I'm complaining about the first movie. Hey, Christy is great. She's okay. Like, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm really passionate about Patricia Arquette's character in Dream Warriors. Yeah, I know this. <laughs> no, I'm, jo- I'm I... joking about that, too. They're, they're equally non-characters. I saw the opening to that. She looked pretty. She looked pretty good in it. Like, in terms of a good performance. He was taking a bunch of, like, caffeine pills or something like that. And I had to leave for some yeah. reason. That's a great movie. That's really good. But, yeah, I like en- I did enjoy the gore in Bloodline. Uh, to a certain extent, I like the campiness of it. Even though I think it was taken uber seriously at the time. Yeah, I think the director took the, took the material very seriously. For sure, and I don't think any of it's particularly good, but for me it delivers on what I want out of a bad movie, which I don't think the first two do. I think that's our main our main point of contention, because I, I did enjoy the first two, and then I watched three and four, and then I gave up. <laughs> I haven't seen three. I might watch it now. Bloodlines was really fun. Well, if you, if you liked it and didn't like the first ones, you'll probably like the third one. I'll check it out. But I mean, that being said, this wasn't for me. This wasn't this wasn't nearly in the realm of like Critters Four or Leprechaun Four because it wasn't as boring. It was still boring for me, but like I wasn't going to like shut it off because I was so frustrated. I guess for me in this one, what made it work in ways Critters Four and Leprechaun Four didn't was the general narrative is like poorly executed as it was. I found compelling. I like the idea of lineage a lot in movies. Like, I love Place Beyond the Pines because it handles that well. And even to an extent, like, that crappy... Well, it's not crappy, but the not-great 2014 Godzilla. I like the kid having to pick up Brian Cranston's legacy. I, I like things like that when it's handled in movies. And Hellraiser Bloodlines is all about that. And it's done in a really embarrassing way. And it's not well handled. But I guess that was enough for me to, like, because the stories were so short, I wasn't losing interest. And there was some really great gore interspersed between just, like, laughably bad scenes. Yeah. Well, I, I liked your description of it being three good hell, or three mediocre Hellraiser movies, but you don't get, <laughs> like, all of them. You just get 30 minutes of them, so it's not that bad. It's more digestible. Yeah, like, each... each- sequence has a moment as good as the the twin security guards getting their heads rolled together into one guy i don't know what's what's that moment for you in like the far past section oh that scene of the girl getting skinned is actually pretty grisly that's nasty i guess i just feel like it had been done before in the series yeah i I mean we see a lot of skinless people sure we see a lot of pinhead too 
That's true. Hey, are are you making fun of me? <laughs> I I liked a lot of the makeup in this too. Like that's always a good. It's always fun to see whoever the new demons are gonna be. We should talk about the the new female demon, the one that gets created when the 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 prostitute or whoever gets killed at the start of the movie, um, mm-hmm. and then the demon gets summoned into her body. Her performance is almost pretty good. Yeah, yeah, no, like, I looked her up, and she's, like, a pretty major Chilean actress. Um, I don't know why she was in this, because she's got, like, an actual career in the Chilean film industry, but I felt like she gave it her all. Yeah, I mean, every now and then, you're giggling at her, but when she nails it, she really nails it. Yeah, I... I would venture to say she had the best performance in the movie. Oh, for sure. Oh, except for Doug Bradley. Yeah. I mean, Doug Bradley always has the best roles in the Pinhead movies. And he gets possibly my favorite lines I've heard from him in this film. Yeah, he... I I will concede to you on that. I... After re-watching, some of the lines set a little better with me. (laughs) Well, you told me this movie was so bad you wouldn't re-watch it, which made me want to watch it even more. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, like, I'm half glad I did, but, like, <laughs> I don't think I liked it anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, that's we, the extent of it. We should talk about the in-space section of this movie. Yeah, it's alien, but with pinhead. <laughs> alien, the other one. but with Cenobites. Yeah, and the kills in the alien section of this are the worst in the movie, outside of the black guy getting his face ripped off. Yeah, no, they're pretty boring. Well, they, um, it feels like a lot of them got cut away. And that, yeah. that that third act is the most notably chopped down. Like scenes of like a character walking down a hallway, and then it'll cut to them in another hallway, and then they're like all sweaty, like clearly they've been running from something, but that just got chopped out of the movie. Well, I think there was like a two-hour cut of it or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a work print that's a lot longer, and uh, the director ended up, asking for his name to get taken off of this movie after he... Did he get fired or did he quit? Do you know? Uh, I don't know. They got the guy who did, I think, Halloween 6 to come in and uh, and finish filming this. So a lot got added in there. And I guess a lot of that got put into the space stuff. Um, but the original director's ambition for this, I really have to applaud, even if it's not great. <laughs> There are cool ideas in this, the coolest of which for me being at the very end of the movie. Uh, Pinhead, very foolishly, gets trapped on the ship, which turns into a giant puzzle box. <laughs> the spaceship folds together into a cube, and then I, it detonates and it kills Pinhead. I Forget. don't know how I felt about that part of the movie. Um, it was fine i accepted it as it came um it was kind of like one of those i don't know what i expected moments you know (laughs) well i certainly didn't expect that i was like why is this why is this horribly (laughs) modeled cg ship so ugly and then that happened i said okay it's a board cube i get it all's forgiven um yeah well uh, I like the concept of like the main guy has a pretty good monologue about the light or whatever it's kind of corny but i i enjoyed it when it, he was like doing the back and forth with pinhead in the end and pinhead what's his line about him being empty do you remember that i am beautifully empty <laughs> yeah like something that. like that. oh man that's so great i i gave this movie three stars you sicko i gave <laughs> it two it may be two and a half can we meet in the middle i'll meet you in the middle on this i'll give it a two i'll, I'll agree to two and a half movie i will move it to two and a half if you do no no we don't have to change it we're just saying the horror boys agree oh okay hellraiser bloodlines is a two and a half star movie gotcha gotcha it's a two and a half star movie which is great because tanner told me he wouldn't watch it again so i'm I'm glad i really was able to make him bump it up a whole star from what he originally had it at no 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 no. it's just a half star isn't it no you had it at a one and a half before you rewatched it yeah well I guess you win this round, Stephen. <laughs> oh boy, Jason X. David Cronenberg right. wants to weaponize Jason, but Lexa Doig wants to freeze him. Jason throws a spear through Cronenberg, and then Doig traps both him and herself in the cryosleep chamber. Jason stabs her, but she gets frozen as well, so when they get found centuries later by the crew from Critters 4, they're able to heal Doig no problem. 
Then Jason wakes up and starts killing people, and it's just Alien, but with Jason. That shouldn't come as a surprise, though. All of these movies are just Alien, but with a less interesting monster. This one doesn't suck, though. It's actually pretty good. I love Jason X. <laughs> Let's be realistic. This may be one of my favorite Friday the 13th movies. <laughs> Cuz they get they get pretty bad before Jason X comes around for me. Like I've only seen clips of anything after like the 4th one. I want to see 6 cuz I guess 6 is Proto Scream. Oh, okay. Like it inspired Wes Craven to do New Nightmare, which was him just testing the waters for Scream, so that uh, could be interesting. Well We'll give we'll give some more Friday the Thirteenth a try. Yeah, so I've only seen the original and the remake, and I'd seen them both on TV back to back on the Sci Fi Channel, and I don't have a particular fondness for this series. Uh, I'd seen Jason X on TV before, but it was a long time ago, and uh, I was very excited to rewatch it, and it wasn't quite as great as I'd hoped, but it is a fun watch. For sure. And definitely above and beyond the best thing we watched this week, right? I have it at the same rating as Hellraiser Bloodlines. You fool. If I had to rewatch one, like, right this second, I would probably watch Bloodlines again. Are you... Oh, man, I'm, like, personally offended by this. Yeah, I'm sorry, but Jason X, it it starts with a lot of promise, but on a visual level, I didn't find it very compelling, and... After that first amazing kill, most of them didn't deliver for me until we got kick-ass cyborg at the end. But what about the girls in the sleeping bags? Okay, yeah, that is a great scene. I don't know. Like, I watched this with Claire, and we just had a hell of a good time watching this, munching on popcorn. (laughs) I don't know. There's just something really appealing about it, and it's basically a parody of every every Friday the 13th movie before it. Mm-hmm. Um, it definitely nails the tone, I'll say that. Yeah, yeah, I'll say, yeah, I'll say that as well. It doesn't, it knows exactly what it is, mm-hmm. and it delivers exactly what I want, and we get David Cronenberg in the start, which I For- think is the mark. Like, if he was involved, you know it's going to be good. Oh, yeah. Even though he was in it for, like, five minutes. Less than that, maybe. And it was probably a favor or something. (laughs) I'm glad he's in it. That makes my day. We should talk about the first kill. So he wakes up after being cryogenically frozen in this spaceship, like, 400 years in the future. And there's this woman scientist sort of running tests on him. And she doesn't notice he gets up. Uh, But then he gets up. And he throws her face in, like, liquid nitrogen or something. (laughs) And her face is frozen. And then he slams it on a table, and it just shatters into, like, bloody bits of ice. And it looks so convincing. The (laughs) wide shot of her head after he smashes it is so disgusting. Yeah. I mean, it's, like, it's perfectly caved in and then only frozen in the bits that would make it the most effective. It's It's a great effect. I mean, they tried something very similar in Critters 4, and it didn't work at all. But he just Uh, froze the critter, though, right? Well, he blew it up, too, didn't he? Yeah, uh, probably. (laughs) We watched that movie like three days ago, and I couldn't tell you a thing about it, other than what I already told you. The poster is designed with him in that new super mask thing, but we don't get that until, like, the very end. Was that a tribute to the fact that we don't actually get Jason in the mask until the third or fourth movie? It's the third, and I don't think so. I know, I'm just messing <laughs> with you. I wish we got more of him in that costume, because it looks stupid, but it f- I feel like it adds to the, the tone of the movie, if you know what I mean. Oh, it definitely does. And, like, this is the movie I thought most closely resembled alien (laughs) except like jason literally is the alien but he sort of functions like the alien Mm -hmm. because he sort of just is around the ship but you never hear him or see him coming which i thought made it the most convincing of any in the series or not the series but any of the films we watched this week like as an alien parody or well as like a like an actual film oh Yes, this is definitely the the best structured movie we watched. Yeah. No, this movie delivers on pretty much everything it needs to. And 
the way they handle some of the side characters, like the, the, the cyborg, she is just lovely. Oh, yeah. I'm just sad she wasn't in much else. She, like, I don't know, it seems like she put her all into this role. She's very charming and compelling, and when she gets her upgrade that just turns her into the same character but Matrixified, she's <laughs> so, just so great. This is the only AI I had a crush on before Blade Runner 2049 came out. Oh, uh, you talking about Anna de Armas? I'm talking about Joy. Yeah, yeah. Did you see uh, Knock Knock by Eli Roth? Oh, is, is she in that? Yeah. She's one of the girls? Yep. Oh. I still gotta watch that. We should watch that for the podcast. All right. It's, it's on Hulu. Oh, That'd nice. Good watch. It's, it's a cult movie in the making. I'm not gonna act like it's a great movie, but Keanu really buys into Nicolas cage in it. Like, his performance oh, okay. is incredible. There's a scene where the two girls are trying to seduce him, and it's musical chairs, and it is just impeccable. Well, I watched Cabin Fever recently, and I I really sort of appreciated Eli Roth for what he is, yeah. even though he he has he has a lot of hits and misses. I'm surprised he's such a his career seems pretty set. Like yeah, Death Wish know. looks bad. Yeah, I imagine it's horrible. Um, but I've I out of the movies I've seen by him, I've seen. Cabin Fever, which I, I, watching that movie for the first time with my dad and all my friends in high school is probably one of the best movie viewing experiences I've ever had. I'm not going to pretend like it's a great movie, but it is very fun with a good audience, especially the pancake scene. Oh, for sure. And and the scene where he's pouring Lysol on his penis. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah. And then I saw The Green Inferno in theaters with my dad, and we had so much fun (laughs) doing that. Um... Which that's also pretty bad, but you have Sky Ferreira playing as a, is it like an anti SJW in a, in a very fun role. She's not in it enough, and then I'm just a sucker for Italian cannibal movies, so that delivered for me. And then Knock yeah. Knock was just so weird. Why does he have such like a strong presence in Hollywood? Is he more of a, more of a producer than a director. Not really. Writer. I think Hostel made a ton of money. Would be my guess. I don't really oh, know. Oh, you right. I always forget about Hostel. It did probably make a ton of money. Well, I know two didn't make as much because of. Um, I think it leaked on torrents. You no, know, Hostel only made eighty million. I don't know what the budget of it was, but. Anyway, we got sidetracked uh, <laughs> by Eli Roth, that that crazy man. Yeah, I feel like we've gone through too much material. Luckily, I have a lot to talk about. So. Okay. okay, do you want to go ahead and do that? No, no, we need to finish talking about Jason X. Okay, what do you want to say about Jason X? Yeah, I guess after the first, like, handful of kills, like the the one where they're in the CG environment, like they're playing the video game, and he cuts the people in half, and then he actually kills them, that one's pretty fun. But mm-hmm. I feel like the creativity goes down a bit, and they just want to set up the cyborg girl shooting him. And introducing the new costume. It just gets a little... I guess I'm kind of wrong because they bring back the the VR chamber at the end with him getting to pick up the... He's a, he's at Camp Crystal Lake and he gets to pick up the sleeping bag and he gets to beat the girls to death in their sleeping bags. That's pretty gold. But yeah. the creativity was fleeting towards the end for me, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. But that VR scene with camp crystal lake was just like oh yeah that was the most that was the most clear like parody on the first films and i i kind of loved like that kind of self-awareness um it honestly like felt like scream yeah for sure the only thing that could make me like this movie like substantially more is if wes craven had actually written and directed it oh that'd be beautiful that'd be beautiful He'd probably kill this movie. Well, and I, I should say, I don't always love Wes Craven's films. I hate The Last House on the Left. I think it's awful, just tasteless. Good soundtrack. I don't like a lot of his stuff. I think the first Nightmare, it's fun, but I don't think it's particularly good. But the Scream yeah. movies, I just adore. I think he was on a roll in that period. And he came back really strong I, with four. Yeah, I mean, all four of them are really solid. And it's like they never miss out on their wit which i think is impressive especially when you get to like the fourth movie like you'd think the humor would be gone by then because it's just been done for 
over and over for three movies. But they find something new to focus on, which is the strength of it. But there is a big issue, and that's that the movie doesn't have Red Right Hand by Nick Cave in it, and that's essential to the series. Yeah, it also doesn't have Jamie Kennedy. Well, which... I'm not going to... Hey, let's not go into details. <laughs> I spoiled Scream 4 for a coworker the other day, and I felt bad about it. Well, I mean, Jamie Kennedy's not even in it, so yeah. it's not like it can be spoiled. Well, now I was talking to a coworker, and we'd mentioned an actress, and I went, oh, they're the... They're the bad guy in Scream 4. And they're like, oh, I, just, no. I just saw Scream 2. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, that's too yeah, bad. Yeah, so that was a shame. It's a, it's a good twist in Scream It's a great 4. twist. So, Quick note, the director of Jason X did, like, one of the only other films he's done is House 3, The Horror Show. Which Tanner and I watched, and I couldn't tell you a thing about. Yeah, Lance Henriksen was in it. I remember there were some cool dream That's sequences. It. The bad guy from uh, the my mother. Let me tell you about my mother. Guy from Blade Runner's in it. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. we watched something that had Sebastian from Blade Runner in it. Which one was that? I think it might have just been Hologram Man on the new Best of the Worst. Oh, you're right. Which, speaking of, actually ties into something else I was going to cover today. Yeah, pretty exciting news. <sighs> okay, Tanner, while you were at the gym. I completed I completed the fourth movie in space. I watched Dracula 3000. Oh no. <laughs> Which um oh god. One of the actors Tom Lister Jr <laughs> was also in Hologram Man. Uh oh, Dracula man. 3000 even more <laughs> than Jason X is a direct knockoff of Alien. So much so that the tagline for the movie is, In space, the sun never rises. Oh my god. <laughs> ah! So I've always wanted to see this movie, because when I was a kid Why? I saw the cover, and I thought it was kind of cool, at the blockbuster we had in town. Arc City, Kansas, don't ever go there. It has like an H.R. Geiger-y looking, um, looking vampire on the cover, and I thought that was pretty neat. You thought Dracula 2000 was bad. <laughs> Dracula... This is much Dracula worse. 3000 is so much worse. Casper uh, Van Dien plays the great-great-great-great-great-grandson of... Uh, <laughs> even more than that, of Van Helsing. Um, uh-huh. And he is not the main actor in it. In fact, he dies about a little over halfway through the movie. <laughs> And he's, like, the first one listed. Yep. <laughs> Coolio is in it. Uh-huh. He plays a character named 187. I thought he was going to be a cyborg, but uh, that's actually what his IQ was before he started smoking weed. Weed? Yeah, and he smokes a lot of weed in this movie. Wow. This movie has, like, a, f- a four-minute-long intro sequence, <laughs> followed by... Another, like, five minutes of little cartoon drawings of all the characters in it in Casper Van Dien narrating their personality traits. That sounds awful. <laughs> sounds like Suicide Squad. Basically, yeah. <laughs> and then they get, they get to this other ship, and the way they do the alien scene, like, the scene where they go down and they're the alien eggs, uh-huh. is they walk into the cargo hall, except... I should add, this ship is just a warehouse with the lights off. There's no real set dressing (laughs) other than a couple of the corridors looking all right. And uh, they go into the the cargo hall, and there's just a whole bunch of coffins there. And that's that's supposed to be like the alien eggs. And Coolio's like, to to the other black guy in this, Tom Lister Jr., who's named Humvee, but then every now and then they call him Hummer, and I don't know if that was intentional or not. <laughs> they, um... He just starts breaking open all the coffins, and he's like, there's gotta be money in some of these! But they all just have ash in them. <laughs> then he cuts his hand, and it resurrects gay Dracula. Wait, who plays Dracula in this? Udo Kier? No, Udo Kier is it in the movie. <laughs> Why is he listed? Udo Kier is the, um... He's, it, they just, he's the old captain of the ship that the vampires took over. 
and he they had him for maybe half a day and they had him stand in front of a camera and just read a handful of uh <laughs> and read a handful of lines that he really overacts in in a kind of amazing way and they just randomly <laughs> put those clips in the movie like they're oh, not edited no. in in any coherent way they play it at the very start so that you know there's a star in this movie <laughs> <laughs> and just put it in a couple times. Uh, so Langley Kirkwood, who I'm not familiar with, plays plays Dracula, uh, but he actually plays Orlock, is what they name him, mm-hmm. like Nasratu, and he is just like Gerard Butler in that you can't understand anything he's saying. Listen to episode two to hear oh, what we man. thought of Dracula two thousand. But he just, he's wearing, like, just a discount store Dracula costume. It's just so embarrassing. And all of the, like, in quotes scares in this movie are just him running past the camera. Like, that's it. What? That's all. Of, like, you know, like, zombie movie, the show the presence of the zombies, they'll have something fly past the camera and it just blacks the screen out for a second. Uh-huh. That's what every single scare in this movie is. God. <laughs> how did how did you sit through this? Uh, alcohol may have been like, involved. Was it like enjoyably bad? Uh, at times. For the most part, no. I'm looking at the IMDB page. Bottom rated movies number 40. Is it really? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty high Yeah, up I saw a lot of people saying it was the worst movie they'd ever seen. And yeah. I, I'm not that far off from a Greek. I'll probably give it one whole star, I think. Uh, but maybe not. I haven't decided. I didn't write it to hide you from having known I saw it. Smart. <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> All right, so I got to get into where this movie goes. Okay. All right, so Humvee, the other black man who is very sexually aggressive with the other women on the ship, um, I would have filled sexual harassment charges on him for sure. He and the co-captain on the ship, we end up learning that she is a robot, um, like a narc robot, to try and see if they were going to steal stuff. She kept listing laws and stuff throughout the movie, and then for some reason, Dracula won't bite her, and that's when we learn why. Uh, They end up being the last two survivors, and they're planned to kill Dracula. They just lock him out of the room they're in. And they set course for the sun just to blow up the ship. And then she says to Humvee, well, you know, I wasn't always an arc bot. I used to be a Model 3 pleasure bot. Maybe we could try that out. And then he's just like, oh, Lord, I'm going to get late tonight. And then they he picks her up and throws her over his shoulder and they walk off screen together. And then it just cuts to a wide shot of the CG ship with, like, a stock stock photo of an explosion appearing on it. And then the credits roll. That sounds truly horrible. <laughs> I, like, I'm glad, I'm glad you did that on your own time, because I would have never, ever wanted to see it that. It is by far the worst uh, movie we've wa- I've watched for this podcast. Well, it wasn't even required, so you only have yourself to blame. I'm a completionist. It's not even part of a series. That's true. But it came out a year <laughs> after Dracula 3 and was definitely aping off of the franchise. So I'm counting it, yeah, damn it. I feel that. Um, well, thank you for that, Steven. I guess. <laughs> I am sorry you went through that, but at the same time, grateful for your uh, dedication to the podcast. Thank you, thank you. Well, you know, I certainly don't. I certainly don't have that kind of dedication. While you were at the gym, I studied film. Yeah, <laughs> you studied the blade. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, um, no, you probably would have been better off watching Blade than this. Hey, hey. I own okay. Blade One and Two on Blu-ray. And I am down to watch them whenever. Okay, we'll get back to that. <laughs> but you have some other news today, too, don't you, Steven? Or are we doing that on here? What? Are we doing? Are we talking about Lynn on here yet? Sure! 
Or we are in okay. talks with uh, Len Kavazinski of Red Letter Media, Curse of the Wolf, B- Blood Prism fame. He might be coming on the podcast. I hit him up on Twitter and Swamp he responded. Zombies. Swamp Zombies. And his upcoming Swamp Zombies 2. Because of this, we might be a little late in putting out the next episode, which is why I wanted to get in on this. Um, Because we're going to try to go through Lynn's entire filmography, if we can, Mm -hmm. um, before the next podcast. So we can give you guys a sort of lowdown on what movies to go for, even though you should probably watch them all. But we'll give our thoughts on, like, all of them. I'm very excited to see Blood Prism. I'm pretty excited to see Swamp Zombies. Myself. You know he's directed 15 movies, right? I know, but they're all on Prime, yeah, so we gotta we do gotta it. We gotta do it. We probably won't be able to watch all together like we usually do, but yeah. we'll get to them. So that's exciting. That is very exciting. Um, yeah. So if anyone else knows any um, people we could hit up on Twitter that would probably respond, let me know, and we'll do that. Yeah, we're definitely open to anyone that wants to talk on the podcast honestly fans or uh movie producers yeah my friend raf wants to come on i say we let him yeah i say we do too awesome nice and we we need to have a a horror boys and girls episode uh where we have our significant others on i think they'll hate it. oh (laughs) yeah i i was so i (laughs) Maybe we can keep this in. I was le- I was planning on watching Total Recall with Claire, and then you texted me that you were ready to watch Leprechaun 4, and I was like, oh, crap, I thought that was later. I was like, hey, Claire, you want to watch Leprechaun 4? And she just gives me the most despairing, like, <laughs> shake of her head. <laughs> like, her eyes went dead. Emily, <laughs> And then she scratched. Emily watches almost every movie I watch for this podcast with me. See, I feel bad for her. <laughs> Like, I don't treat Claire like that, Steven. I think this is an abusive relationship. I mean, when you live together, it's like... I, yeah, I guess that's do true. Do you want to go off and do your own thing, or do you want to watch a movie with me? She'll be like, I guess I'll watch the movie. And then it's always the ones <laughs> that you pick that she gets angry about. Yeah, well, I talked to her. She said she doesn't actually hate everything I pick. Really? Yeah, oh, okay. I, don't know, I don't know if that's true, though. <laughs> she complained quite a bit okay. about your movie choices. I know. Hey, should we watch the remake of Black Christmas, even though it's probably awful? Yes, actually, I have a pitch for you for an episode. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Okay, it's mm-hmm. called New Horror, but it's like new metal, like NU. And so uh, okay. we'll watch, like, Leatherface, uh, Hell Ra- uh, Hellraiser Judgment. We can watch the. I feel this. We can watch the Black Christmas Wait, remake. Judgment. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's like for the new edgy horror movies. We could watch the Silent Night Deadly Night uh, remake. Did they do that? I think it's a remake. Yeah, it's just called Silent Night. Huh. I don't want to make all of them Christmas though, so never mind. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we could do a new horror too. Jingle bu- Jingle Smells. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, that could be fun. Also coming right. up in soon episodes, we'll be watching Intruder with the Raimis. Yeah, that should be exciting. So. Um, who else was in that? Bruce Campbell. Oh, and it's and it's set in a set in a grocery store. Which so is definitely appealing to me. So yeah, and I'm gonna be working at grocery store. Um, so that'll definitely be something we'll enjoy. Um, we're also watching Iguana with, uh, God, I'm blinking on his name. Uh, Everett McGill. Yeah. Which maybe um, we should save that for a trilogy of his movies because he's also in People Under the Stairs, which I haven't seen. And mm -hmm. that one movie about cavemen with Ron Perlman. Oh yeah, we could do that. That'd be fun. Um, yeah, sure. Okie doke. So yeah, episode two, episode uh, five might be kind of late, depending on whether or not Len can work with us. If not, we will be watching those movies, I guess. Yep, yep, yep. It'll be a good deal. Uh, thanks for listening, guys. Yeah. If 
if we have listeners. I don't know. I know Raph listens every week. So thanks, Raph. <laughs> thank you, Raph. We love you. Um, yeah. Well, do you want to close it out for the night? Uh, sure. I think we're done. Goodbye. Yeah, I think so too. All right. See you guys.